church, you know, following a little cup of coffee and a treat, of course, but then we'll get it going. Um, the council meeting has been changed from the 15th to the 22nd for this month, so July 22nd is the uh, Zoom council meeting. I wanted to highlight that. And then also next Sunday, we are going to be starting a new, did I say August? It's July Sorry, sorry. It's no, it's July. Yeah. It's a July meeting, July twenty second. Yeah. Did I say that? Sorry. <laughs> I don't know what month it is. <laughs> um, July twenty second. Sorry. Yes. And then next Sunday, um, Adult Bible Study is going to be starting a new study on the Book of Philippians. So now is a good time to come join us. It's at 9 a.m. on Sunday mornings. So uh, I thought I would highlight that as well. Um, let's see, any other, any other announcements that I might have missed? Okay. Well, welcome to our worship service, and we are brothers and sisters living in a free country where we can worship our Lord, God, and Savior out in the open without fear of reprisal. And in so saying, let's start off with a song.
rise for our confession and absolution. What? No, not on. Uh... Yes, confession and absolution. Here we go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death, of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. In the stead by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do we have some of those reading? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> and now finally, yeah. today's Psalm is 123. To you I lift up my eyes. O you who are enthroned in the heavens, behold, as the eyes of servants, look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid servant, to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God, till he has mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have had more than enough of contempt. Our soul has had more than enough. Of scorn of those who are at ease, like the hand of the ground. Oh, uh -huh. 
partakers of your heavenly treasure through your son jesus christ our lord who lives and reigns with you in the holy spirit one god now and forever said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to nations of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants also are impudent and stubborn. I send you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. And whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's epistle is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I must go on boasting. Though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who fourteen years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man I will boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of the man who sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from being too elated by the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Jesus went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue. Many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hand? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown, and among his relatives, and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. 
And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over an unclean spirit. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. And now please join with me to confess our common faith in the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may see it and we'll continue on to our sermon. of life. 
So we can try to answer that question by looking at our normal daily lives. What is the worst part of the day? Now for some, including somebody I deeply love, getting out of bed is the worst part of the day. But for us morning people, it's not so bad. But also it seems that getting up can be wonderful or terrible depending on what you're getting up for. Getting up for school, lying there like a lump, and slowly, ever so slowly, getting up and getting dressed. Maybe with a dad, I'm still tired. But getting up when there is no school, boundless energies and shining smiles. Indeed, we had to make a rule in our house you can't get out of bed till 6 o'clock. Otherwise, they'd get out of bed at like 4 or 5 a.m., which I have to say is way, way earlier than when they get out of bed for school. So what then is the best part of the day? Well, I suppose it depends on the person, but it would seem like there's commonalities between us. Spending time with loved ones is the best part of the day with many, whether it be snuggling with your spouse at night, hitting each other with boxer swords, or playing board games. Not that I'm talking about anybody in particular. But how about answering that question in a broader sense? What are the best and worst things that ever happened to us? Now, again, these answers will vary, but there's some things that we have in common. And for us Christians, it would seem like the answer is obvious. Jesus saved us. But for the rest of us, for everyone else, our best days likely include connections to our loved ones, such as the birth of children or getting married. And the worst days would be the day that those connections were, perhaps only temporarily, severed, like the times of death and divorce. But we can also have best and worst experiences that are more introspective or self-centered, but not necessarily in a sinful manner. I mean, I still remember hiking to Camp Muir one day. It's a place near the summit of Mount Rainier, which is about 10,000 feet in elevation. And it's a beautiful place. And on that day, I did it in record time. I met fun people going up and down that mountain. But some of my worst days were the days that I just found myself to be inadequate. I simply was not able or willing to do that which I had to do. In what we read from 2 Corinthians this morning, we find Paul talking about some of the best and the worst parts of his life. Although it seems like what Paul thought was the worst part of his life turned out to be a blessing. Paul starts off by saying, saying something that's not just strange, but almost anti-gospel. I must go on boasting. Boasting is directly forbidden for the Christian, as we are told. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So what then was Paul doing? Well, earlier in 2 Corinthians, Paul wrote, Let no one think me foolish, but even if you do, accept me as a fool, so that I too may boast a little. It seems like at that point, Paul, Paul was boasting to offer proof to people that he really had been sent by Jesus to teach them the gospel. And he did that by telling them about all the extraordinary things that he had done and had happened to him. And he did that because there are these so-called super apostles out there that were saying that Paul was the false apostle and they were the real apostles. But of course they weren't. It was they that were the false apostles. And just to clear up a point, boasting about yourself is a sin. Like we're told, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. But that is not to say that we should say we are terrible at everything, because that simply isn't true, because we are all good at something. Instead, we do what Paul tells us elsewhere. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. The one thing we can all boast about is that we're saved. And along those lines, we can all boast that we, God has blessed us with some skill. Because when we boast like that, we're not really boasting about us, but about God. And C.S. Lewis offered a perspective on this too. He said, pleasure in being praised is not pride. For here the pleasure lies not in what you are, but in the fact that you have pleased someone you wanted and rightly wanted to please. Paul summarizes his teaching on boasting with this, Though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. 
Paul seems to be saying that in the end, boasting doesn't do anything important because it, do, it doesn't make us more like Jesus or draw us closer to him. And so he moves on to something that is more important, the vision and revelation of the Lord. Paul went on, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Paul says so much here, but on the other hand, Paul says that Paul leaves a lot unsaid. Now, we're going to be going through this as we go along, but think about, think about this. For all the emphasis that many believers put on heaven and eternal life, how much information about it is revealed to us in the Holy Bible? Paul said that this vision was seen by a man in Christ. That is, it was seen by a believer. It seems pretty clear that Paul was referring to himself. And indeed, later on in verse 7, Paul wrote that it was he himself that received this revelation. But why then didn't Paul simply come out and say that it happened to him? It seems like because this was about something he would not boast about. All the things that he boasted about before, his lineage, how much he suffered for Jesus, and all the works that he did for Jesus, were, in a certain sense, rather human-centered. That is, his parents were clearly human and intentionally raised him in a godly home. And all the times that Paul suffered revolved him remaining steadfast. It was, and it was Paul himself that went out and did all the things that he did. But of course, as Paul says elsewhere, Jesus deserves all the glory for that. Like he said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. But it seems like this vision that God gave to Paul was so radically different, so fully separated from anything else that Paul could ever do or instigate on his own, that he was refusing to speak about himself in connection to it, so there would not be even the merest appearance of boasting. Like all the other times in his life, it seemed like Paul wanted the glory to be God's, like Paul wrote in Romans. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And that would seem to make Paul very unlike those other super apostles who, given their past actions, would have gladly boasted about going to heaven. And we are also told that this happened 14 years ago, but we aren't told anything else about the circumstances of the vision. But still, it seems like there is something we can learn from this. It seems that Paul didn't tell anyone else about this for 14 years, or at the very least, he never wrote about it, because this is the only revelation we have about it in the Bible, which again seems to point to Paul's extraordinary humility. Paul also said that he was caught up to the third heaven. Now, Paul is not suggesting that there are levels of heaven, as though some people will be on a lower level of heaven, but other people will be on a greater level of heaven. Instead, it seems that Paul is saying there are three levels of heaven in the world in which we currently live. The first heaven is the sky with all of its clouds. We might specifically call it the atmosphere. The second heaven is the place of the sun and the moon and the stars. We might call it outer space. Those are both physical places. But then we have the third heaven, which is God's home the place where God and his angels dwell. That is not a physical place. It's purely a spiritual place. Paul wrote that he didn't know if he went in the body or out of the body, but only that God knows. Given that Paul didn't write much about it, we shouldn't talk about it that much. Although it does show us that there are some things that God has decided we don't get to know, and we need to be okay with that. Paul, uh, Paul went on, but again, he did with surprisingly little detail. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. Paul referred to paradise, much like Jesus did when he spoke to the man on the cross as they were both being crucified. Jesus said, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. In the surrounding culture at the time, the word paradise basically referred to a beautiful and cultivated garden. But it seems here, Paul is using the word paradise to refer to the third heaven. And then we get to the most enigmatic part of what Paul wrote. He 
He heard things that he that cannot be told, which man may not utter. But why such mystery? Maybe what he saw was so wonderful that simply could not be described in human words. After all, who here can adequately describe the beauty of a common sunset? Or who here could fully put into the words the love that you have for those closest to you? And however wonderful those things are, it would seem that heaven is far better. So it would not even seem possible to begin to describe how good heaven is going to be. Or maybe God did not allow Paul to reveal what he saw, because God has hidden information in the past. For example, God once said, Daniel, shut up the words of this book and seal the book until the time of the end. So it seems like we can't definitively say much more about heaven, as it seems maybe we can't understand it, or God just doesn't want us to know about it. And maybe that means we ought not to try. But recall a question that was asked a while back. Why is there so little information about heaven in the Bible? And a possible answer is, it just doesn't matter. It's not that important. Maybe the fact that we are going there and our eternal lives will be perfect when we get there is all we need to know. Instead, it seems like we should just glorify Jesus now, whenever and wherever we are. But that's not to say that Paul going to heaven was unimportant. Indeed, it seems that God took Paul to heaven to give him peace, to know that no matter what happened to him here on earth, he had life in heaven laying before him, and nothing that anyone could ever do could rob him of that. Like Jesus said, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. And no suffering that Paul could ever go through would be in the least equal to what you experience in heaven. Like Paul wrote another time, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Indeed, glorifying Jesus and not himself would seem to have been Paul's overriding goal, because he concludes this part with, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. Now, let's skip ahead a bit in the text. We heard about a high point in Paul's life. Now, the low. Paul wrote, So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. The first and last part of what Paul wrote here is important. God purposefully put Paul through a terrible tribulation and for a specific purpose. What Paul experienced was not chance or bad luck, but the will of God. However, we need to be very careful with what conclusion we draw from this. To start with, Paul was not being punished for sinning. And that would seem to me that if something bad happens in our life, we shouldn't automatically assume that God is judging us for a specific sin that we have committed. Sometimes, because we live in a fallen world, we will suffer through no fault of our own. And likewise, when awful thinking, awful things happen to other people, we should not assume, and certainly should never say, that God is punishing them for their sins. Sometimes, after natural disasters, people will say it was the judgment of God. But unless they were told that by a direct revelation of God, it would seem that that is an ungracious and unrighteously judgmental thing to say. But why then did God inflict Paul with such suffering? We're told to keep him from being proud. As was said before, out of practically everyone else on earth at that point, Paul had perhaps the best reason to be proud. God had specifically and directly declared him to be his chosen instrument in an obviously miraculous event. And as we just heard, God had taken Paul to heaven. All of that had at least the possibility of making someone proud, and Paul was by no means sinless, like Paul said of himself, for I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep doing. So, in what almost seems to be a contradiction, it seems that God put Paul through great suffering out of love, because God wanted to protect Paul from the sin of pride. And make no mistake, pride is a terrible sin, for twice in the Bible, we are told, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. 
But now we have a question before us. What was Paul's thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan that harassed him? And to make that question even more challenging, this is the only place in the Bible where that phrase is used. Now we could say that Paul used the word flesh, so that could mean that Paul was suffering some kind of bodily affliction. And some believe that the specific condition that Paul had was vision problems, because Paul wrote about having problems with his eyes in the past. Once he wrote, I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. But others believe that the thorn was persecutions, possibly from those so-called super apostles that Paul was writing against throughout 2 Corinthians. But much like before, we aren't really told anything specific, so that would seem to mean that God did not consider it important for us to know for certain just what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. We can simply trust that we, what we were told. Paul's thorn caused him to suffer, and we can all identify with that. We have all suffered in the body, some of us greatly. We have all suffered at the hands of others, and again, some of us greatly. But why then did God put Paul through all of that? We already know one reason, so that Paul would not be proud. But there is another one too. Paul wrote, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so the power of Christ may rest upon me. Why did God put Paul through so much? It seems that it was so that Paul would learn that he could not save himself. If Paul could have overcome his thorn on his own, that would at least have been a minor reason why he didn't need a Savior. Paul's weakness was proof, undeniable earthly proof, that he needed God. We will only know, truly know, that we need God when we realize we're insufficient. When we honestly try to treat our loved ones with love and respect, but we fail and hurt them, we see we desperately need God. We know from countless experiences that we just don't have it in us to treat people as we know they need, to, they deserve to be treated. We're just too weak. But God gave us red grace. He didn't treat us like we deserve for all the times that we've hurt our loved ones. No, look at what God said. To, look at what Paul said that God said to him. My grace is sufficient for you. God didn't say, my strength is sufficient for you, but my grace. Paul saw that because he was too weak, he had to rely on God. He could not force God to do anything, but Paul didn't have the strength or authority or moral justification to make God do anything. God would have been within his rights to either hear Paul or let him suffer, because Paul didn't deserve anything more. But even more, neither Paul, nor us, nor anybody else deserves salvation. But still, God saved us. When we realize that we are weak, that is, when we realize that we are sinners, then and only then can God save us. Grace is why God saved us, and God saved us for himself. Like we're told, it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. That we can bring joy to God is perhaps one of the greatest blessings we will ever know. And also, God's grace is sufficient. That is, there is more than enough for us and everyone else that has ever existed or ever will exist. The grace of God is greater than all the sin that has ever existed or ever will exist. But of course, we have to put our faith in God to receive that grace. Like we're told, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. While being shown to be weak would seem to be one of the worst things that could ever happen to us, truly it is one of the best things because it is only that way that we can be led to the grace of God and salvation itself. And so, my beloved, I leave you with this. Let our weakness glorify the grace of God. And now, may the peace of Christ which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. And now please rise for our first one.
you can be seated and we will collect our offerings. And if you have any prayer requests, you can pass them on towards the middle. And we get to sing a special offering. Did you also like drums? The words are in the bulletin, two thirds. church and during our moment of silence feel free to pray out loud so we can pray with you let us pray for the whole church of god in christ jesus for all people according to their needs to the lord blessed forever father of christ our strength and shield for hears the voice of pleas for mercy and helps in every need that he would never cease to save his people lord your mercy hear our prayers for the workers of the word, that they may be devoted to their task and to prayer, and for many servants in God's church, that neither the preaching nor care of his people may fall into neglect. Lord, your mercy. Hear our prayers. In thanksgiving for Christ, our righteousness, revealed in the sight of the nations, that you would strengthen the song of his church for musicians, poets, and artists, that they may serve skillfully, and for the congregation of God in this and every place, that we may sing with boldness the eternal new song of Christ. Lord, your mercy. Hear our prayers. For the home, that God would soften obdurate hearts, turning parents and children toward each other in love and patience, that he would banish the spirit of impudent stubbornness and rebellion from all. Lord, your mercy. Hear our prayers. For our nation, that I may defend it against its enemies, for our leaders, that they may preserve from temptation, and for the work of all civil authorities, that we may be able to live quiet and peaceable lives according to his word. Lord, your mercy. Hear our prayers. For those whose pain is chronic, whose suffering is unknown, who wrestle with difficult thorns in body or mind, or are tempted to despair, that they may know in their weakness they are strong for the sake of Christ, whose grace is sufficient for every need. Lord, your mercy. Hear our prayers. For courage and weakness, insult, hardship, persecutions, and calamities, to boast in Christ and his cross, by which we in our sufferings are sanctified. Lord, your mercy. Hear our prayers. We pray for the sister in Portland, Maine, who is having many health concerns and challenges to keep faith 
and uh, keep her strong. Amen, Jesus. We pray that just like Paul, you help her be strong in your weakness, giving her the self-assurance that one day all this is going to pass and she will be with you, although there will be no more weakness anymore. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And prayers for the Wins family as they are all headed to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Amen, Jesus. We thank you for the means that they are able to go there. We thank you for family gathering together. We ask that you protect them going and coming and journey. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And we pray for the wars and unrest around the world in Ukraine and Gaza and Haiti. We pray that brave men and women are able to stand against the forces of evil and that evil forces are eradicated or are changed and follow you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And we pray for human trafficking. We pray that anyone that participates in it faces justice. But we also pray that they are saved by your unending grace. And we pray that anyone that is victimized by it is also saved. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And we pray for Bailey and all that she is going through, that you lift her up and let her know that she is loved and you have a plan for her. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Yes. Prayers for my friend Betsy, who had hip surgery on Tuesday. I haven't heard how she's doing. Holy Father, thank you for healing, hearing all of our prayers. Help us to remain faithful no matter how you answer them. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We turn now to the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. <laughs> of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he said to 
he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Body of blood in your court case, treat your tree of life for Jesus.
Thank you. 
Please rise for our next images.
so it's the last week, oh, it's the first week of the month, so we get to start off with anniversaries, and this, I'm, I'm standing this month, for real, right? Woohoo! Alright, how many years? 45. Ooh. 100? Two. Oh, two. <laughs> and now we get to move on to... Birthday. So if you're born in the month of July. All right, there we go. All right, so let's whip up a tune. Join us for that, but no matter what, have a blessed week of the Lord.